Tonight, we welcome Lawrence Vale, a Chicago native and the Ford Professor of Urban Design and Planning at MIT. Mr. Vale is the author of several books, including Architecture, Power, and National Identity, From the Puritans to the Projects, Public Housing and Public Neighbors, and Reclaiming Public Housing, A Half Century of Struggle in Three Public Neighborhoods. Tonight, Mr. Vale's program will focus on his most recent book titled Purging the Poorest, Public Housing and the Design Politics of Twice Cleared Communities, a comparative look at the public housing experiences of Chicago and Atlanta. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lawrence Vale back to Chicago. Thank you to, to Craig, and thank you so much to the, the library and also to the uh, National Public Housing Museum for co-sponsoring this. And uh, thanks to all of you, uh, the, the number of people times the number of the degrees uh, of temperature out there is, is extremely impressive uh, uh, to me. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be back in Chicago, even in January. Um, and, uh, and so glad that those of you who were already here felt like coming tonight. Um, it's also uh, a pleasure to be part of the library's One Book, One Chicago uh, program. The, the Great Migration, uh, the, the subject of Isabel Wilkerson's uh, book, The Warmth of Other Suns, uh, is really an important backdrop to my, my own work here. And uh, even though that book is set only partly in Chicago and uh, mentions public housing only a couple of times in, in passing, uh, and none of her protagonists began their lives in Atlanta, um, uh, it's still um, the story of urbanizing African Americans has everything to do with the birth and development of public housing. Um, but really, at base, my book is not about the great migration, um, but about the smaller kinds of migrations that have happened once those other journeys had happened uh, already, um, the, jo the journey to the big city. Uh, and, and those smaller migrations were often forced uh, and go by names that are a little bit less pleasant, um, displacement, eviction, uh, things like that. Um, when, when rural blacks um, migrated to urban areas, whether they were coming into the south or, or up to the north, uh, they were migrating into racially restricted neighborhood patterns. And, and this was uh, contributing to uh, an enormous amount of overcrowding uh, uh, that led to people labeling these neighborhoods as slums and led to calls for slum clearance. Uh, and then in turn, it is slum clearance that leads to the birth of public housing uh, and, and uh, much of that would eventually become disproportionately housing African Americans. Um, so in short, the, the Great Migration uh, really does form an important uh, backdrop and precursor to the issues that I want to talk about um, tonight. Um, so I've given this the, the title Transforming Public Housing. Uh, and, and that really has, I think, several related um, meanings. Uh, it's certainly a descriptive term about an evolving history. Um, public housing has indeed uh, undergone a lot of transformation over 75 years. But transforming is also an, an action verb. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, certain changes that have been initiated by particular people for particular purposes. Um, and it's important to do that, especially here in Chicago, where, where until recently the, the transforming of public housing has been called the plan for transformation. Um, it has particular resonance here. So I want to talk, though, about public housing in a, a, a broad historical sweep. Um, but we'll talk uh, in particular about a few specific places, uh, Cabrini Green here in Chicago and Techwood Clark Howell uh, in Atlanta. Uh, on the slide up uh, above here uh, on the left, um, it, it talks about city planning means slum clearance. Uh, and certainly that is uh, vitally close to the uh, origins of 
of public housing, um, the building of modernist public housing. But certainly, more recently, city planning has also meant uh, the clearance of public housing, the clearance of the modernist public housing itself um, to build something else. And, and typically, that something else has been vaguely termed mixed income housing. Um, and sometimes, and the reason I put in my book twice cleared, uh, is that this has happened on those same sites. Um, this has happened in Chicago from, uh, from Chicago to New Orleans, from uh, Toronto to Tucson, San Francisco to Boston. Every place has got its twice cleared communities. Um, these are the kinds of, of places that I've been fascinated about um, because it's not merely that sites are being cleared, it's communities that are being cleared. Um, once in mid-century when we talked about slum clearance and, 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 uh, and urban renewal, and now at the end of the 20th century and the, in the beginning of the 21st century, uh, happening again. Um, and it's often uh, places uh, like the two images that Camillo Vergara uh, took in uh, Cabrini Green, 10 years apart, uh, that's exactly the same location. You can tell by the, the, the play slides. Um, they're, they're there, here, and that's what's left. And this is you know, what, what is revealed, um, the newly desirable, investable uh, vista that emerges uh, when public housing uh, comes out in, in that. So it seems to me, um, and this is the other part of the book title, um, that you have to think about these twice-cleared communities by bringing design and politics together. Um, the aesthetic and the socio-political that get conjoined when you're replacing the negative image of a place uh, with the process of replacing the negative social aspects of the community. Um, so I see this as a kind of triple um, social experiment. Um, the, the sense being that, uh, that, that there's really not just a single design uh, decline and fall kind of situation. Um, but a three phases, uh, the, the phase that talks about clearing slums and building public housing um, for, um, for really an upwardly mobile working class, uh, people who are sort of barely poor, uh, and, uh, and replacing the, poor, the poorest that lived in those communities uh, with the merely or barely poor. Uh, then a middle phase that's really a consolidating of the, the poorest uh, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And then, really, another phase uh, where public housing since 1990 has been cleared uh, and often tried to find another set of people to replace the poor with the less poor uh, again, uh, thereby pur purging the, the poorest. And so what I'll do tonight is talk uh, initially about communities in Chicago and Atlanta where I think the benefits of development and redevelopment have not been very equitably allocated, and then mention more briefly at the end uh, some possibly more encouraging alternatives. Um, so slums to public housing, um, even, even the concept of slums and the concept of public housing are really pretty uh, hard to, to pin down. Uh, the two images at the top are both images from slums that were cleared to to build Cabrini Green here in Chicago. And both of the images below uh, show parts of Cabrini Green, um, very different kinds of places in, in each instance of slum, so-called, and in each instance of public housing. Uh, it's really very, very different. Um, uh, but it's, it's a reminder that, that public housing was never uh, simply humanitarian aid to the poor. It was a, a sorting and evaluation system. It was a reward to a certain kind of poor person uh, and a marginalization of others based on race and ethnicity, based on family structure, based on earning capacity, or, or even behavior and, and uh, attitude kinds of things. Um, and then there's the second clearance, um, where we really don't know what the future is going to bring. Uh, uh, and so uh, what I'm asking is to suspend uh, disbelief, the, the sense of, you know, what's he talking about purging the poorest? Isn't public housing where all the poor are consolidated uh, to, to begin with? Uh, I'm, I'm now saying that, no, that may be a, a conventional view, um, um, but, but really the alternative view uh, is that that's the middle phase of a, of a three-phase three uh, evolving attitude uh, towards uh, towards how to house the, the poorest. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm you know, trying, trying to argue in the two cases that I'll talk about before. Um, and uh, next. Uh, so 
uh, the, the presentation then will be to talk a little bit about the broad changing modes of public housing in the, in the US, and I, and I mean that in its prehistory as well as its history, um, and how we've responded to that. And then the, the communities that I've mentioned in Atlanta and Chicago, and then conclude with some more hopeful um, alternatives. Um, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that the public housing that was built uh, starting in the 1930s uh, all the way up until the, the 70s was sort of the only game in town. Uh, and since then, there have been multiple other, other things going on in the world of, of deep housing subsidies, most importantly, the housing voucher system uh, that, that kind of explodes and then by the early 90s passes and then doubles uh, the, the public housing units that we think of uh, now. Um, in, if you look at, at Chicago, uh, it's a, a pretty extreme picture, and you don't often see these charts um, uh, graphed together. Um, so public housing gets up to 43,000 units, uh, not all of them occupied, uh, and then starts plummeting well before uh, the plan for transformation kicks in in the year 2000. Uh, and then at the same time, there is this other, other course of housing vouchers that that will shoot, shoot up and, and pass it. Um, but uh, still, the, the, they're 20,000 and trying to get back up to 25,000 uh, units of public housing. It's even more extreme uh, in Atlanta, though, where, again, it peaks up here at 15,000 units or so, uh, and then uh, has the same vouchers replacing it, but completely plummets down to 4,000, most of whom uh, are for, most of which are for, for uh, elderly uh, uh, households, the, the senior housing that has been there. So some people um, think of Chicago as having done uh, an extreme reduction, but the Atlanta approach has been even more uh, hostile to public housing or radical uh, to the changes in public housing because they've simply eliminated nearly all of the public housing for families and much of it for seniors in favor of a housing voucher system. Um, while putting the remainder of, of uh, public housing for families uh, into mixed income communities where they're a very small percentage of what's um, uh, allowed um, in. Uh, so what, what I think, though, is that these charts don't really tell any of the interesting parts of the story. And, and to do that, I think we have to think about the, the basic challenges that go all the way back in our, in our history to, to try and ask the, the, the more... Uh, pressing and deeper rooted question about when does the government actually choose to subsidize housing for low income people and what form has it taken? Um, this is not something that just gets invented with public housing in the 1930s. It's not, it's not just the New Deal. It's a lot of old deals that are, that are going on. And, uh, and some of them are part of a reward tradition that goes back centuries. So I put a picture up of the Homestead Act and, and a stamp commemorating it. Uh, 1862, uh, if, you, uh, if you got some land from the government, as long as you built your house on it, uh, within a certain number of years, that land was yours to develop. This was a place and a system for worthy working households that were going to deserve the support um, of, their, of their government. Um, and it was part of a long tradition of rewarding certain kinds of behavior on the part of low-income people uh, in terms of their land and, and housing. On the other hand, there's been an even longer uh, tradition, uh, at least 200 years before the Homestead Act in 1662, the first almshouse appeared in this country on Boston Common. And, and there, um, the tradition was, well, what do we do when people really just can't afford to live on the town? What do we do uh, if they don't have family and, and a church or, or someone that can support them? And the answer was, well, we build a, a, a special house for those members of the public that can't afford uh, to, to live in the, in the town. And they get named uh, almshouses. Sometimes they're known as houses of industry, workhouses, that kind of thing. This is one in Boston from 1800. Uh, that's the men's wing, that's the women's wing, and there's the chapel in between um, to make sure that they were being properly reformed uh, and penitent in their, in their reformation. 
Um, and, and so uh, this kind of judgment about which of the poor are deserving the support of the state, it did not get invented with public housing. It, it's something that I think has been with us uh, as Americans even before we were Americans uh, in this, in this content, uh, continent. Um, I, I love this particular book. Um, this is the frontispiece from a book called Civilization's Inferno, Studies in the Social Cellar by a man named Benjamin Orange Flower. Uh, he, he's sort of the uh, Jacob Reese of, of Boston, except he didn't know how to take pictures. But fortunately, he had a very good artist to work with him. And if you see what he's done here, is he's shown what's meant by, public, uh, by poverty. Uh, so up here are the happy, uh, wealthiest, wealthy people on the top. I don't know why I may not be able to get it, but if you could see the, 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 top, the top image are the happy, happy people dancing, oblivious to what's going on below them. The second stage um, below are, uh, is labeled out of work. It's like men uh, who are out of work and poor through no fault of their own. It's the Depression of 1893. Uh, and these are worthy working people that simply uh, can't uh, make it on their own. Then the, the third from the top are uh, the women and the widows and orphans. Again, poor through no fault of their own, deserving of the sympathy and largesse of the state. And then there's the social seller, uh, the people at the bottom who simply cannot be trusted, don't deserve anything, and, uh, and really have to be distinguished by experts um, and, and removed from the, the roles of, of the, the needy or put in these almshouses uh, in, in some other way. Uh, so when you get public housing, and here is an image in the self-labeled uh, authority of, of Boston in 1940, um, they're passing judgment about levels of poverty and types of poverty uh, among the people um, that are uh, that are seeking public housing. So these are the five members of the, uh, the board um, who took it upon themselves to try and determine who deserved spaces in, in public housing. Um, and, and the goal then was to try and use the rules of the day in the 1930s to equivalent, equivalently eliminate slums in order to build public housing. And, and uh, so the, the idea is that there would be this complete transformation of the space and the character of the people by moving from, uh, from the public housing on one hand to the, uh, to the slums on the other. And uh, uh, it happened in all sorts of different cities, and you can see the, the images that are there. The, the green one in the middle here on, on Newark shows these kind of darker images in the upper left of policing and kids sitting out on the stoops and creating various juvenile delinquency distractions. And then on the right, everything is, is pale and happy and Boy Scouts uh, and women happily doing their dishes on their new modern sinks uh, in public housing and, and, and things like, like that. And, and that's the kind of uh, counterpoint. Um, in Chicago, um, there was a, a view that, the, that this uh, kind of veneer of lakefront prosperity uh, held a dirty backyard uh, behind it and that all of these places that need to be torn down uh, because they were simply too expensive to the city to maintain. Um, if you see on the right the, uh, the, the difference in fires or tuberculosis or crimes of violence or juvenile delinquency between slum and non-slum made it simply too expensive to do the services for these slums and therefore they should be um, uh, cleared. Uh, there were various arguments made about disease and, and bad housing um, like that. And this is in the, in the annual reports and in the various uh, kinds of documents that would, would come along uh, across the country. Uh, I particularly like this one that, that uh, was an annual report from, from Boston after they had built the first eight of the pre-war uh, public housing developments. Um, assuming you can't read it, it says that um, out of the shadows into the, into the sun, uh, it beheld eight shining developments rising fresh to the sun where once in dirt-filled dilapidation the slum dwellings had shambled in contaminating hopelessness against a gray and somber sky. Um, so the, 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 the drama of the language of, of uh, everything is seen in sort of before and after, black and white, light and dark, uh, images that uh, assume that the dark alley is replaced by the sunshine and openness of the, the public housing. Um, what they didn't want to tell you 
is, and I could say this definitively, the two kids in that picture were not among those in the alley. Um, because what's happening is a complete social switcheroo in the middle of, of this whole, uh, whole kind of thing. So that the people who are living in one set of place uh, are simply not the ones that are going to be welcomed back. Um, and so when I've done this, uh, uh, to look, look at actually who gets this housing, um, and here is an image from, from Boston again on the, on the left, um, it's really um, well described by the cartoon where the, where the guy with his slum clearance bag of tools comes in and says to disease and dispiritedness and delinquency, we hope you'll be gone with the slums. Um, and uh, the idea though uh, was to make it seem like this was housing for the poorest to come back and be relieved of their terrible conditions and their terrible behaviors. Um, uh, but when you actually look uh, at what happens, when I, when I found records, uh, 50 to 70 percent of the people at various sites that were cleared in, in Boston applied for public housing and only 2 to 12 percent ever got places in it. It was not for those sorts of people. Um, Norfolk, Virginia has a, an image from one of its um, uh, brochures that I think explains it particularly well. Uh, I love the image of the, the citizen uh, of, this, of this development. That's the way they describe the kid who's sort of shot from below next to the picket fence. Uh, and here, the young, uh, uh, the, the, the teens in the same development uh, where it, it says, uh, uh, here they a boy meets girl in Brentwood Park home, all three look nice. Um, uh, so your teen is going to be uh, re uh, redeemed uh, too. But the, the, the details in, in the middle uh, are, are what, what I think is quite interesting. Now, uh, again, my, 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 my pointer isn't working, but the middle, uh, the middle of this over here uh, talks about 47,000 dwellings, of which 17,000 are, are substandard. Uh, and, they, and then they want to figure out, well, okay, of those people in the substandard housing, who gets the public housing? Uh, and what it starts by saying is, well, 4,000 of them uh, earn uh, too much to be in public housing. Okay, we understand that. But then there's the middle one. 7,000 people earn too little. Uh, in other words, you can be too poor for public housing because you're a bad risk uh, for being able to, uh, uh, to, pay their, uh, to pay it and to have a stable job and all sorts of things. So public housing, when it was built, was not for those, uh, uh, those large numbers of people living in substandard housing who couldn't be trusted um, to, to be good tenants when it, when it happens. And so that's a really important part of, of trying to understand um, this. I mean, what does it say about a society uh, if the public housing is for the poor but not the poorest? You know, it's pragmatic. It, it may be financially more viable. Um, but it also is, is showing distrust of the uh, least economically successful people, especially if they're jobless, even if it's a, a Great Depression, suggesting you know, their joblessness is their own fault. You know, where are they on that chart of uh, Benjamin Orange Flowers' frontispiece? You know, which of the poor are they, you know, are they? How do we make sure we don't admit the people from the social cellar that, that goes on? So, um, so anyway, it, it's, it's a world of carefully vetted households uh, that gets put into public housing, um, and the results have not been uniform around the country. Um, you have uh, extreme cases uh, that, that happen in large cities that, that have public housing that bear very little relationship to one another. Um, you have um, Brad Hunt's wonderful book about Chicago, Blueprint for Disaster that explains all that went wrong with the Chicago housing's mismanagement, Chicago Housing Authority's mismanagement over a period of decades. Um, and it would lead you to think, well, of course, that's just, you know, this is a terrible thing to do, high-rise public housing. It can't be managed. It can't be workable. Uh, and then you have almost the same year a book by Nicholas Bloom, on the other hand, uh, called Public Housing That Worked, New York in the 20th Century. So he's not saying, oh, it was like public housing was paradise, this book in the middle about Chicago in the, in the 40s and 50s, uh, when it was carefully vetted and all of that. Bloom is saying in New York, which has far more high rises, far more public housing than Chicago ever dreamed of having, uh, has not been tearing down its public housing and not been having the same kinds of problems through the decades, um, but actually managed to manage it reasonably well. Um, so, 
it's, it's not an inevitable kind of uh, thing. So let me um, give you two examples. Um, one from Atlanta and one from, from Chicago, uh, and then some, some examples of places that I think might um, be a little more positive uh, than, than these particular stories. Um, Techwood uh, Homes, uh, shown here as, as near the downtown of Atlanta, uh, those of you who know it, next to uh, Georgia Tech, uh, and near downtown as well, and next to it, the Clark Howell development that gets built a little bit area, a little bit later. Um, uh, Techwood takes over a nearly all-black neighborhood for an all-white project in the 1930s. It's one of the very first public housing, probably the first public housing project to open in the country, uh, and it takes over a black-occupied slum in uh, in an area that the whites had uh, 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 labeled a slum. Uh, and then, um, within a few decades, the new developments of Techwood and Clark Howell are at least as, as vilified as the slums that they had replaced, and they get torn down and replaced um, in the 1990s and the early 2000s by Centennial um, Place. That's the next income development uh, that, along with the 1996 Olympic Village, uh, replaced the, the public housing. Um, so the first phase is promising modernist alternatives to the slums, and the second phase is, fa is promising new urbanist alternatives to the public housing. Um, and, and so the HOPE 6 program uh, that HUD has been doing since the 1990s has been a kind of forcible attempt to return public housing to its early area, era of high selectivity um, and willing to replace an existing population with a less distressed alternative um, community by putting people who are less poor back in uh, and purging many of the poorest uh, residents. Uh, and it's been the role of design and designers to show that this has been done and, and to help with that. Um, so it's really a kind of combination of a, a symbolic politics, uh, concern with replacing the negative image of a place, and a process politics. Um, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's really a, what I call a design politics if you put those things together. Um, and uh, and it, uh, it's uh, a place that in the first phase looks like that on the left, and then here is the, on the right is the uh, Centennial Place community that is there. And uh, when, it, when it gets started, it's because Atlanta, like many other cities, feel that their slums are strangling the, the city. So this map uh, of, from the mid 20th century with the gray areas uh, calling out the location of the state capitol and, and city hall, um, suggests that the whole center of downtown is, has got this ring of, of slums that are kind of a, a threat symbolically to the, uh, to the government uh, and, its, and its symbols. Uh, they did the, the kinds of slum statistics that, that were popular all over the country. Uh, they would note that 39% of uh, the population was in slums, a big number, but that was costing 53% of city services, 72% of juvenile delinquents were in that, that 39% of the area, 48% of the cri crimes, and then this was the thing that really got people, and they're only providing 5.5% of the tax revenues. So, so it's, it's sort of like we can't afford slums, that's the language of the day. Um, and, uh, and then the question would, would happen. So it's the belief in this transformative power of design, but it masks the fact that they're choosing an alternative community of people. Um, they're, they're, they're talking about modern housing, but they're selecting a different group of, of people. So they give you delinquency rates before and after, and uh, tuberculosis rates before and after, and all of those kinds of, of things. Um, but it's the successive forces of displacement and replacement that are really occasioning the transformation. Public housing is not reforming delinquents, it's replacing them. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different kind of thing. Uh, and here's the man in Atlanta behind it. Um, this is his uh, long polished autobiography that took four extra writers to help him eventually put it together. Uh, Charles Palmer's Adventures of a Slum Fighter. Um, and he lived up in an all-white subdivision built in the 1920s called Brookwood Hills, and uh, he had an office down in, in downtown, and he uh, used to have to commute uh, past this unsightly area just after Georgia Tech and just before he would get to the downtown area. And, uh, and he finally gets out of his car and starts looking around and decides that this is a slum area that he doesn't want to see, and it's a big uh, draw 
uh, against the, the land values of the, um, of the country, uh, of, the, of the city, and turns himself into a, a self-described uh, slum fighter. Um, so this is what, what, he, what he sees uh, are these houses that are in this kind of low-lying area near the, where the creek is coming uh, through. And uh, it's a, an area almost entirely African-American occupied, although he would soon deny exactly that. Um, and you can see where the, the uh, uh, stream turns in the middle of that image from the 19th century. And then the road on the, on the right of the other image is the same bend uh, because they've simply buried the stream bed and eventually it floods like the picture uh, below because they, they really couldn't uh, fully, fully do it. Um, but it's, a, it's a, an area called uh, Techwood Flats. The, the area on the right that becomes Techwood Homes is a black community. The area on the left was a mostly white area. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's really a complete design politics of, of race. Um, uh, Palmer himself freely admitted that he was doing this because he could get good real estate commissions from the sales of slum properties and that he, as he put it, wanted those slums cleared away, not for the sake of the slum dwellers, but because they were affecting the value of our adjoining property. That's about as honest as you can get you know, uh, about it. Um, but the remarkable thing is that in his memoir, he says that, they've, that he cleared a white neighborhood. As he put it, from my cursory and hesitant glances at these huddled structures, it seemed improbable, but the records revealed nearly a 1,000 white families were jammed into this slum. Um, but he simply completely misread the uh, uh, census tracts and, and counted things that weren't part of the area that he was clearing and, and all of that. And when I actually did a map of who was there in the 1930s from the 1930 manuscript census, uh, you can see that whole right side of it was almost entirely African-American occupied, uh, torn down to build a project um, that put all low-income blacks out of the way of Atlanta's downtown and Georgia Tech. Uh, he simply wanted to find a way of restoring certain areas to white occupancy. Um, this is an image of, of uh, the neighborhood that was torn down, uh, another one. Um, here's an image uh, inside. Uh, I suspect that she's smiling until somebody bothered to tell her that, by the way, we're tearing down your home and you're not welcome to move into the place that we're going to build instead. Um, and here's what the records actually look like. Uh, from that black community, precisely 0% uh, returned. And even from the white impoverished area that was built, uh, was torn down to build the, uh, the Clark Howell side of the development, only 8% of the people returned to it. Uh, they were just not the kind of poor person um, that was wanted. They wanted young couples uh, with, with kids. They wanted uh, white families. Um, blacks did gain entry, but only if they were carting white people's furniture. Um, uh, it was whites only in the Techwood pool of tenants. Uh, and so uh, the, the images that were, were going on in the annual report was, was highlighting public housing, uh, at least for white people, along with the great monuments of Atlanta. You know, that's the kind of, of things uh, that are being highlighted in these annual reports. Uh, occasionally they would show images of, of black um, residents, but they would do things like caption the picture on the bottom right, these Negro children have been scrubbed till they shine, and are they happy? You know, uh, you know so uh, it's, it's a system of uh, very close scrutiny and eligibility uh, determination, interviewing to get in. This is a, a reward uh, for good behavior and good tenancy and being the right race for the right place. Um, that's what they were trying um, uh, to do. Um, the problem was that as this map from 1969 suggests, um, the city of Atlanta, uh, almost as segregated racially as Chicago at the time, um, had Techwood Clark Howell right in the middle of this uh, expanding black community. And uh, it was not, uh, not something that the white leadership could do to, to kind of hold this as an area for white occupancy on the Techwood side. And so, um, by the 1960s, uh, it um, becomes increasingly black occupied just at the time as they start declining to offer the maintenance and the other kinds of needs that the housing would have um, 
uh, wanted. Uh, it still looks pretty verdant uh, here in this image, uh, aerial photo of it from 1981, um, but, it, but it was really on the ground becoming an increasingly difficult place uh, to live in, uh, given the disinvestment and the increasing poverty of the, the residents. Um, residents took, uh, took things in their own control. This was what, what they called the Bat Patrol, um, where, where women and their children would, would uh, arm themselves when going around the neighborhood and you know, make it pretty clear that they weren't going to be messed with. And, um, uh, and so the, 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 the self-organizing to protect themselves was going on just as developers start salivating over, isn't this a great place uh, to uh, build something other than public housing? We've got Georgia Tech here, we've got downtown, we've got Coca-Cola headquarters in a high rise overlooking this place. Uh, and they're, they're all trying to figure out, well, how can we do this? How can we uh, do this? And, uh, and by 1991, the, the picture here, the group uh, Tenants United for Fairness, or TUF, uh, um, one of the great acronyms in public housing activism, by the way, um, uh, uh, say, you know, says, look, you know, you're starting to come up with a whole bunch of schemes that don't have much of a place for us. So this is just before the, the HOPE 6 project uh, has, has been introduced as, a, as an option uh, from the federal government funding to redevelop public housing. But the, the tenants are deeply suspicious about what might um, come uh, to do this. The place is fully um, occupied. Uh, and then Atlanta wins the Olympic Games. Uh, the 96 Games are announced in 1990. Uh, and uh, they said, well, here's a way to get money. Uh, we're going to tear down part of the project uh, and put up the, uh, the dorms for the, uh, the, the, the housing for the Olympic athletes, and then it can be used for dormitories uh, afterwards. Um, and so in the, the chart on the left, you can see 100% occupancy uh, of Techwood in, the, in that, uh, and then it, it plummets before they even get the grant. Um, uh, and it's used as uh, the kind of instigator for this whole, whole thing. Uh, the special assistant to the Georgia Tech president, uh, Dr. Norman Johnson at the time, uh, describe this, the scene, you know, here, here's one of the finest international corporations, and here's one of the finest technological institutions, and here's one of the world's best cesspools. It doesn't play well, you know. So uh, he's, he's saying, the, Rene Glover, who becomes uh, the head of the housing authority in the mid-90s and lasts all the way till last September, almost 20 years in that post, um, makes a kind of subtle distinction here. Redevelopment is not being done because the Olympics are coming, it's facilitated because the Olympics are coming. Um, but yes, that's true. And when I talked to her in 2010, you know, she said, you know, the Olympic dormitory is being right across the street from Techwood. The world's TV cameras are going to be there. You couldn't help but ask, well, I know we're here at the Olympics, but what the heck is all that over there? Something had to be done. You know, and the question is, well, what did have to be done? And what was happened, what did get done um, was uh, taking those 1,200 uh, apartments that had been built in two phases in Techwood uh, and uh, planning a completely different uh, community, one that uh, when it finally came out um, and got built as Centennial um, Place, named after the Centennial Olympic Games, that's the, uh, the reason for the name, um, 78 households or 7% of the people that had been there before were, were actually welcomed back. Um, Here's an aerial photo of, of what the place looked like as, as redeveloped. Uh, talked about as, as this great new urbanist uh, concept, but it looks like an awful lot of parking lot to me. Um, uh, uh, but here's where you know, the bigger picture is. Uh, in the foreground, you can see Coca-Cola headquarters uh, staring down at this. Uh, there's a, in the middle, there's Roosevelt uh, House Senior Housing, a high rise, not long for its place. Then you can see the former Olympic Village. Um, uh, on the left, and then on the right, uh, you've got Centennial Olympic Park that was built for the Olympics, and then uh, the rest of the area that was cleared that for World of Coke, Georgia Aquarium, and then the Civil Rights Museum that's soon to open. And then you've got pretty much the whole area between Georgia Tech and downtown replaced with public housing out of the way. Um, and this is the kind of views that you see towards Coca-Cola or towards um, uh, downtown in, in both directions. Uh, so this is what, you know, what has happened uh, in Atlanta uh, is uh, to, to really replace the public housing concept um, with 
uh, vouchering people out and, uh, and adding some uh, other kinds of project-based rental assistance for those of you who want to get into the, the terminology of it. Um, I put the total up here at the top on that, on that thing because the people in Atlanta will say, well, we've got more than we ever had before. I don't think that's true. That was maybe briefly true, but it's been declining uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, and, and so I think there actually is a net loss. Uh, and amazingly, uh, in, in the context of public housing nationwide, they've also taken down a lot of the senior housing. Um, so here's that Roosevelt house. Um, there's Renee Glover uh, uh, with a grandmother and her granddaughter there. Um, and, and here's the site of of the implosion in 2011, the senior house. Um, uh, there's Coca-Cola headquarters in the, in the background. And um, it's a lot of white people watching housing for a lot of black seniors being uh, torn down rather dramatically. Um, the Georgia Tech president and his wife uh, seem to be enjoying uh, their neighbor's implosion. Um, and, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a very sad and controversial story. And you can either believe that everybody's better off with their housing vouchers, as the Atlanta Housing Authority uh, would have it, or you can say there have been some significant winners and significant losers in this process. Um, Chicago. Um, let me say something about Cabrini Green. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a place that, that has been famous long before it was a Cabrini Green there uh, because of the, the, the book uh, that talked about the Gold Coast and the Slum from 1929, uh, remarkably uh, showing in the, in the bottom right here, the, the, the dots are, are the uh, philanthropists uh, and the, uh, the, sorry, the, the circles on the, on the right are the philanthropists and the, the dots in the middle are the recipients of philanthropy uh, and showing the, the wealth on the lakefront side and the poverty immediately adjacent uh, depicted in another map that came out in the 1930s after, after Zorba uh, showing the insanity rates. So you move from the low insanity rate on the lakefront to the highest possible insanity rate. I mean, this is like insanely poor, I guess is the, what you're supposed to, to get out of this. But, but it, it, you know, it, it, it becomes a, a situation where um, you have uh, high poverty and high insanity uh, together in an area that was sometimes called Little Sicily, but often called uh, Little Hell, a name that, that actually predates it. And at the center of Little Hell was a place called uh, Death Corner. Um, and it's one of the most bizarre places in the history of, of Chicago. This is the, the corner of what had been Oak Street and Milton. Milton's no longer with us. Um, and between 1910 and 1930, there were more than 100 unsolved murders just at that um, at that intersection, uh, and the, the murders, including the solved ones, was running at the rate of about 30 a year. Um, so this, the first part of that is, is harder to explain. The second part gets into the Al Capone and various other sort of prohibition gang warfare, uh, and people uh, you know, shooting from underneath the sidewalk up the stairs and, and getting somebody right on the corner. Uh, and so it wasn't surprising that people wanted to completely clear out Chicago. You know, so the Metropolitan uh, planning uh, Metropolitan Housing Council, that's the precursor to what we now have as the Metropolitan Planning Council, um, uh, talked about, if you can read in the middle, 36 square miles to be rebuilt here. They were proposing to clear 36 square miles of a city. I mean, it's just, it's just an astonishing figure to, to think about what that actually could have meant. Um, to go from Belmont, uh, on the north to 63rd Street, and everything between the Loop and, and Kedzie, uh, largely seen as unworthy and unvaluable uh, and, and worth being torn down. So here we are in the Loop with soot, noise, and dirt, not quite as bad as hobo land that's uh, labeled uh, up there. Um, but, but it's pretty, uh, pretty extreme. The only valuable things on the south side seem to be the University of Chicago uh, and Jackson Park. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, as things are changing, uh, the, the, uh, there's a wish to kind of clear out uh, a lot of the, um, the concerns of the black population that's starting to move into the north side. So here's a map from 1930. Every, um, every image on the, 
the, on the left there, uh, it, which shows the, the future footprint of Cabrini Green. Um, everything that's uh, colored in uh, black is a black household that has um, been moving into that area already by 1930. And this is right about the time as they decide to just tear down the whole uh, little hell neighborhood. It's still partly Sicilian. Uh, this is Father Luigi Gianbastiani, uh, who is brutally and, and vigorously opposing uh, anything to happen to his, his parish that he's about to lose, especially uh, because he thinks that it will cause more black people to be able to move in. Uh, he writes uh, a letter to Elizabeth Wood, the head of the housing authority who had been championing uh, integration uh, and insisting on it. Uh, he writes to her uh, to condemn the co cohabitation or quasi-cohabitation of Negro and white because this hurts the feelings and traditions of the white people of this community. By this cohabitation, the Negroes might be uplifted, but the whites, by the very laws of environment, feel they will be lowered. Um, uh, so, so this was you know, a, a racial battleground on the north side. Um, and so it could be washed over with, with images like flowers grow where slums once stood, uh, and replace the, the, uh, these kinds of housing on the top with the row houses of Cabrini on the bottom. Um, but it was nothing but uh, a neighborhood challenge, and especially because uh, just as they're about to open this, uh, the Second World War breaks out, and instead of being housing for anybody in the neighborhood, uh, it gets given over to priority for war workers and uh, families of servicemen. Uh, so the, the consternation of the neighborhood that was already worried about racial change and other kinds of, of things gets even worse when they discover nobody from the neighborhood is going to get one of the new apartments um, and that the rents are set nearly double the rates that had been proposed in 1939. Uh, they, they got their lawyers together and they got nowhere. Um, uh, so here is the, the opening in 1942 um, and uh, it uh, is uh, another place where one neighborhood has been replaced by a very different uh, community. Um, and it's right on top of uh, the, the Death Corner area that, that had been there uh, before. So the, the, the first part that gets built is that little rectangle, and then they still have their eyes on the larger neighborhood. And part of what's going on um, is that this is the one piece of the city uh, where large numbers of uh, African Americans are not on the black belt of the south side or the west side, but, but have actually moved into the, the north side um, towards Division Street um, there as well. And so I put a quote up here from Isabel Wilkerson's um, book, the one book, one Chicago book, because she's, she's really explaining how this impacted uh, one of the women that she writes about most poignantly in the, in the book. Um, it's, it's a place that it's a moment in time when the black belt uh, is really being uh, forced open by the movement outward. And the, the, the map on the, on the bottom starts to show the way that black occupancy is starting to overflow the black belt between 1939 and 1950. So Cabrini um, is, is part of that story and gets built out further um, between 1955 and 1962 with the mid-rises and high-rises of Cabrini extension uh, north and south and then jumps Division Street to the William Green homes and then becomes in 1962 Cabrini Green. Um, and so in addition to the 600 or so uh, row houses that are built on those bars in the, the lower left, uh, you get another 3,000 apartments into uh, high-rises and, and mid-rises. And uh, it, it becomes an a, a increasingly African-American occupied uh, location. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of the, the reasons that Cabrini um, went into a process of decline, um, uh, except to say that the row houses had a, a much longer period of, of success and are being fought for to this day. Um, the high rises had some problems pretty soon after occupancy. But the real problems uh, happened only in the, the late 1960s. Um, there were a tremendous amount of violence in the Cabrini area, probably the third area of the city that experienced violence after Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, the one that people don't often talk about uh, was the area around Cabrini. Um, then in 1970, there were the sniper killings of two white um, policemen um, shot on the project while, while doing community police work. Um, and then, um, 
uh, just a lot of uh, racialized violence on black and white terms, but even more uh, black on black uh, crime uh, and increasingly a lot of, of gang related uh, activity. Um, the, the irony is that as this place is getting uh, developed and built out into the Cabrini Green that, that, that we know or knew until rather recently, incomes were actually going up um, uh, all the way um, through the 1960s. Uh, um, so if you look at this chart, it's a little, a little hard to, um, to judge, um, but, but if, you, if you read on the, uh, on, the, on the left side, the incomes are going up to 1970s. If you look at it, the bottom line on the, of this here and the, the charts on percentage of median income on the right, you'll see that it's like 50 or 60 percent of the Chicago median income in 1950, uh, and then it starts dropping, but still is 40 percent or more in 1970, and then, and then really plummets thereafter. So in other words, when it's built, these are poor people, but not extremely poor people. It was not built for the poorest, but it became uh, that way. Uh, there were efforts to try and um, repair things and, and do PR campaigns uh, to, to encourage people to, to keep moving into Cabrini in the, in the 70s and 80s, but uh, it really was uh, falling, falling short. Um, there just were piecemeal repairs and security efforts that just didn't do enough. Uh, when Vince Lane came in as the uh, uh, chair of the CHA, uh, he got on top of the building, um, but I'm not sure he really got on top of the problem, um, uh, despite the famous or infamous uh, sweeps that, that went on um, to rid high rises of, of drug-related crime. Most people will conclude that the security gains were, were short-lived and the, the costs were enormous and diverted funds uh, from other, other uh, activity. And then um, if, if things couldn't get worse, uh, they did. Uh, the, the famous sniper shooting of Dentrell Davis in 1992, uh, who is a seven-year-old, um, killed while he's crossing the street uh, from his Cabrini home to his school, holding his mother's hand. Um, by a sniper from another building who later explained he was aiming for someone else. Um, the damage was done and the outrage in Chicago nationally, internationally, I've counted hundreds of newspaper articles that continue to be memorializing that moment, uh, really, really changed uh, everything. Uh, amazing for me is when I went back and charted the uh, location of Dentrell Davis's murder, I found it was precisely 200 feet from Death Corner from the early part of the 20th century. I mean, talk about haunted sorts of, of places. So Chicago applies for a Hope Six grant um, and immediately targets to, to the buildings around where, where uh, the Davis shootings had happened. And, um, and then uh, it uh, becomes this protracted battle because the people in the, in the city uh, wanted to put only 325 replacement low-income units into, into it uh, and, and instead develop this larger Near North Neighborhood Initiative that would be billion or more dollars across the whole area that really was seen to having very little place for low-income residents. The TIF district, uh, really a broad um, remaking of that whole neighborhood that would diffuse public housing into smaller mixed income development. A perfectly reasonable uh, proposition if it had actually been carried out in the way that it, it once uh, could have been, um, but simply uh, uh, caused the residents to say there's too few public housing units coming back, and they sued uh, in 1996. Uh, the, the litigation delayed the process till a consent decree in 2000, and then things have still proceeded very slowly since, since 2000. Um, meanwhile, what happened was that people uh, started building all over the fringes of, of the development, um, uh, providing 10 or 15 percent uh, of their housing for um, former Cabrini residents, but doing these mixed income uh, developments and, uh, and tried to uh, put in a few of the people who had a right of return. Um, so you can see the dotted lines of the, of the image of the, the project footprint and then all of the activity that has happened there starting in the early 90s. Um, one of them uh, at Northtown Village uh, on, the, on the fringe uh, proposed 30% 
uh, return for public housing residents. 30% uh, resident public housing, 20% tax credits, and 50% market rate. And uh, the market rate stuff in 2000 just went like, like crazy. In, in seven hours, um, they sold 47 of them in the first, uh, first seven hours. And there's this 60 minutes uh, uh, image that, uh, video uh, clip that you could see on, the, on Peter Holston's uh, corporate website, Peter Holston being one of the developers there, uh, that describes the, the, uh, the scene there. And, and there's one point in the, in the 60 minutes clip where, where one um, person describes it, it was just a feeding frenzy in there. I mean, everyone was screaming and yelling. One lady yelled at her husband, just buy whatever's left, it doesn't matter what it looks like. You know, this is, you know, this is what uh, you know, was going on for the market rate. But then they had to find 79 units for Cabrini residents. Uh, and as Peter Holston put it uh, to me, we were just given a whole bunch of names to look at by the housing authority and we sort of picked and chose the best. Uh, and then he said about one in five work out okay. Um, so it was really a challenge to find people that would be acceptable to a well-meaning and well-intentioned uh, and, and civic-minded developer uh, and still begin to, do the, to undo the damage that that community felt had been done to it by, uh, by tearing down so much of Cabrini um, Green. Um, around the neighborhood, there have uh, been a, a bunch of these uh, redevelopment sites that have smaller uh, amounts. This is uh, Mohawk North, um, where a new set of row houses that were combined uh, a, a few Cabrini residents. Um, the man in the bottom, um, Puki, who uh, talked to me about, about the process he had gone through to, to go uh, and get one of these apartments. So he was really happy about it, uh, that he got it, but he's been completely bewildered, as he put it, by all the young blonde couples and their little dogs, and, and he really saw little sign of anybody mixing. And so when I asked him to take, if I could take his picture, that's the way he, he posed for it on, on the bottom. Um, another place, uh, Old Town Village West, um, developed by Dan McLean of, of MCL, who did Mohawk North, uh, shows the contrast between the kind of new housing that's there and the lingering presence of the green homes. Uh, I took the picture in 2009. Needless to say, that tower isn't there uh, anymore. Uh, and what's in the foreground was built in the anticipation that it would be, be gone. Um, meanwhile, after three years of litigating the, the HOPE 6 proposal, after it was funded, or sorry, that, that's just arguing about the proposal, then four more years of litigating uh, to reach a consent decree, the process to redevelop Cabrini site stalls again uh, because there are disputes between the residents and the developers, and it's again Peter Holston uh, doing much of the, the work on this, over who, who, who gets to control the management, what kinds of social services, what kinds of uh, things. So there are disputes within the developer team itself about uh, which people um, will be distributed into the uh, which kinds of buildings, and it took all the way until 2005 to get a contract signed. Remember, they get the Hope Sticks money in 1993, so we're already to 2005 to get a contract signed. Uh, and they're aided by the residents, have got legal teams, they've had great support from uh, UIC uh, staff uh, and faculty, Roberta Feldman, Itai Zalalem, uh, the residents. Um, gained a number of important concessions, um, but it certainly also slowed down the process. Uh, so many, many times uh, this is a, both a victory for, for residents, but also um, making things move extremely um, slowly. So eventually the, the first major place uh, on, the, uh, on the site of Cabrini itself opens as park site of of Old Town uh, just in time for the real estate market to collapse in, in 2008. Um, so, you know, the best of Chicago in your backyard, Old Town, new style, Starbucks was ready and waiting even before the tower was down. Uh, there are even two Starbucks. I once had trouble meeting somebody there because we picked the wrong Starbucks across from Cabrini Green. Um, <laughs> at, at, you know, it's, it's pretty e extreme. And, um, uh, and you know, so it's supposed to have the same 50, 30, 20 mix that North Town Village, um, but what happened in the real estate crash was that so many of the condo purchasers uh, canceled uh, their deposits immediately after the, the bubble burst uh, that the market rate ownership 
units were half empty for a long time, and then the people who bought in at high prices felt trapped and frustrated and angry. Uh, and meanwhile, the public housing contingent that was supposed to be 30% are moving into their full share of the units. Uh, so you get a tense community where many of the market rate people feel they'd been misled about the intended mix of people, and many of the ex Cabrini residents are chafing at the rules and restrictions of the private management company. Um, so uh, the, the intentions uh, were, were very hard to, uh, to carry out uh, in any way that, that kept people happy. Uh, and so with the crash, uh, they had to uh, go in and reduce uh, prices. Um, this is the, uh, a web-based ad from 2009 um, trying to convince people that new bargains still await. Um, uh, but most of the screams were not necessarily the happy delight shown in the, in the image, I don't think. Um, uh, so here we are at Cabrini with uh, many of the, the same kinds of uh, murders um, that had the site of the murders of Dentrell Davis, the site of the, the, the killing of uh, all those people in the early part of the 20th century um, that, are, that are going on, the, the sign honor, honorary Dentrell Davis Way, is there? I, I just couldn't show Peter Holston the picture of, of all of the things that were could be overlaid on top of the the diagram of the site of of Parkside Phase Two. Um, um, but it's a you know it's a it's a very difficult uh, situation and and became you know even more so this fall with the opening uh, of uh, the Target store. Um, you know, so the Cabrini reds and whites are gone and replaced with a kind of different uh, red and white um, uh, and uh, on the site of the William Green homes. Uh, so the people who got jobs there are happy. The mayor looks happy, sort of. Um, the, uh, um, but, but, you know, the, the question is yet again another delay in returning housing for extremely low-income people to a valuable site where many had been promised. Here's the bottom line. 20 years into Cabrini Green's redevelopment, 3,600 public housing units have about 400. Um, uh, and so, if you ask, you know, the, the housing authority, uh, they will say, "Well, you know, what, you know, what, what's happened? Where did these people go?" Um, and the answer, despite the glossy brochure here, is that it's really hard to, to really judge that. Um, this is the 2011 report on Cabrini uh, residents, um, asking, you know, where. Um, where did they go? Um, but but it doesn't really uh, enable you to to answer that that question in quite as uh, full a way as as you would like. So it'll say that uh, large numbers of the um, population have been uh, put into uh, 58 or something like that of the 77 community areas. But the light orange of that image below can be one or more people. So it's really mostly the dark orange areas that will show where, where people ended up. Um, and it's not nearly the, the spread. Or you can look at the pie chart that will say, uh, OK, 45% of the people have vouchers. 20% uh, have uh, traditional uh, CHA housing. And in the light gray, 35% got mixed income housing. Well, that sounds pretty, pretty reasonable, except that's not from 3,600 units uh, that's just the last thousand residents or so that people are still able to follow. Um, so it's just very hard to know where, where to begin uh, in, in trying to understand um, that, um, that transformation. Um, what, you know, when, when is the baseline that you measured against? Who are you, do you really try to follow? Uh, and how much has been, been done? And, and now that it's been uh, renamed uh, Plan Forward, um, the, the question is whether the people uh, in the Cabrini row houses uh, see much of a, a forward plan for them other than forward moving, moving on uh, to elsewhere. It's hotly debated. This is from uh, October 2013 showing uh, the sort of vague language about what the, the plans are for the remaining areas of, um, of, of the city. Um, and it's been typical uh, across the ways and in some ways uh, it's been a tough sell in this in this real estate market. Um, these are the the last data that I've been able to see as published statistics, and maybe somebody from CHA or elsewhere has got some updates on this. Um, but here, if you if you look the second from the top, Parkside of Old Town uh, in that 
particular phase that it refers to is, is like two-thirds um, uh, complete. Um, but most of the others are very small percentages. I mean, so lots of highly touted things as centerpiece of transformation uh, in Chicago just haven't moved along as, as, as far as possible. And, and so if you look at the 25,000 units that are promised to be brought back, um, and, and you look at the 26,000 households that were promised a right of return if they, if they were tenants in October of, of 1999, it's about 10% uh, of those 26,000 that actually have gotten apartments in these mixed income communities. Um, you know, so it's, it's heavily touted as the centerpiece, but it really hasn't uh, held up. Uh, so let me just conclude with brief moments of, of, of asking about some alternatives of, of what might be done differently than Chicago or Atlanta or these particular cases in Chicago and Atlanta, since there are certainly variety in both Chicago and Atlanta itself. But, but it's important to have the, the, the national picture on this. Um, so it's possible, I would, I would assert, and, 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 and have seen examples, that you could still have communities that serve the poorest at the end of a twice cleared community, um, or a process that facilitates good options for the poorest, as I think they've done in Tucson, or, um, or ways that really mix in uh, the poor rather than mixing out the poorest as San Francisco has done at North Beach Place. So one slide on each of these three and I'll conclude. Um, Orchard Park, uh, now called Orchard Gardens, um, was one of these twice cleared communities, uh, a slum area, so-called, in, in Roxbury, uh, built and biracially segregated in the phrase of the day, mostly a, a white development that became mostly a black development, cleared in the 1990s and developed um, in the new urbanist style that you see depicted below uh, as Orchard Gardens in the 2000s. But what they did was they put 85% of the population um, uh, back in as public housing residents and managed it well, designed it well, and did a number of things um, that have um, enabled most of the former residents uh, to be invited back. Uh, and the community seems to be thriving. Um, in Tucson, um, they had a, a, a very long and fraught history over urban renewal, sometimes surprising to hear about a place like Tucson, but had a much bigger clearance uh, of the area, the Mexican-American barrio just south of, of downtown that was cleared. The county chambers housing, uh, the second from the, the top in the, in the right-hand uh, images, um, opened in 1967 and was cleared in 1999 uh, and replaced with a place called Posada Sentinel in 2000. Um, so they had this terrible reg legacy of, of urban renewal, but the housing authority there um, worked very carefully to say, we're going to try and lim uh, limit the displacement. Um, we're going to phase the redevelopment and allow people to live on site and return to the housing if that's what they want. Or we're going to take you out and show you uh, a series of single family homes and other structures that we, the housing authority, have bought up in other subdivisions around the city, chosen for proximity to transit and good schools, and let you, if you happen to own a car, uh, take one of those or, or can deal with the transit, so that the bottom right is actually replacement single family home public housing that was offered to people uh, if they didn't want to live through waiting around on the site for the, the public housing. Um, so this was a, a, a careful process of treating tenants as well as possible. Uh, and uh, even though uh, in the end not that many came back, um, they, they had really good options. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the North Beach uh, case in San Francisco um, cleared once early on by, by something called the earthquake and fire of 1906, and then, uh, so it's a thrice cleared community, um, and then cleared again in urban renewal. I love the image in the middle of the smoke uh, and the clarity of public housing emerging from it with Alcatraz prison in the background. Um, so this is right near Fisherman's Wharf. It's right near a very gentrifying neighborhood in North Beach. Um, and it gets redeveloped as North Beach Place in, in 2006. And they say, OK, we're going to put 100% of the public housing units back on the site. Uh, and uh, if you think we have too much concentrated poverty, we're going to uh, 
mix in a group of additional tax credit housing for working families with 50 or 60 percent of the area median income. Uh, and we're going to add a new supermarket underneath, new off-street parking, and new retail. And that's what they've done. Um, this is an alternative in an area that you know, had the same development kind of pressure as the area around a Cabrini Green or a Techwood, and San Francisco behaved very, very differently. There are a lot of reasons why it could be different, but it's worth asking, uh, in the end, one final question. You know, is the question that we should be asking, how can the number of low-income households that need to be accommodated be kept to a minimum so that the development's going to be financially appealing to developers and private investors? Or could we ask the question in just the opposite way? What's the maximum number of equitably screened, very low-income households that can be accommodated in a mixed-income development while still ensuring a safe and, and stable community? Uh, you know, in the United States, public housing has been transforming, but I don't think it's been transforming very equitably. Um, but it's possible, as I hope I'm showing at the end here, to do that uh, in some equitable ways. And I very much hope that Chicago can do better soon. Thank you very much. We're probably running short on time, but I'm, I'm told if there is anyone that has a question, there's a microphone up front if you want to do that. Um, any, anybody with a question? Um, yes, can you, can you get to the, the mic, please? To what extent in the course of these debates over these decades in these various places has that distinction between folks who are working for and those who are not to what extent was that considered significant in assessing the likely outcomes of various demographic mm -hmm. uh, breakdowns and, and shufflings and percentages? I think it's a really crucial variable going on there. And I, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and so most dramatically, I think here in Chicago, it came out in the 80s in the Lake Park Place case where Vince Lane came up with the idea of the mixed income new community strategy and said, well, we can mix incomes by having half coming from the regular public housing and half being uh, an employed group of people who are still low income, and we can redevelop housing around that term, and they did it. At, at Lake Park Place, and it's an experiment that at least initially received pretty positive reviews. I haven't seen a long-term evaluation of how well that has, has gone. Um, the other thing that people noticed when they tenanted Lake Park Place was that 40% of the public housing side of it were also working. And so part of the problem is that people have tended to stereotype public housing residents as non-working when large numbers are working, especially after welfare reform, uh, and uh, they're just not making much money to be able to afford market rate housing, like lots of other people that can't afford market rate housing. If I can follow this up, was well, any thought specifically what I'm trying to drive at given to the idea that, gee, if we put public assistance folks with working poor, maybe that'll make it tougher on the working poor? Did anybody, was that ever considered? Um, I'm sure that people talk about it in those terms. I think the, the thought was that this would be the, the, the better mix for the other, the other group to have people who were working but not just market rate people that had very little uh, kinds of uh, connection in, in other domains um, in terms of their incomes and their, and their work experience. Um, um, I've heard less about anything hurting the working poor by pairing them with an, a, a non-working poor. But, um, and it would be good to look closely at the developments that have done those mixes and see whether those situations have, um, have uh, worked out. The one I've been studying in San Francisco at North Beach, which is uh, you know, essentially that model, uh, has worked out pretty well. And I, I hear um, very little uh, complaint from the, the people in the tax credit units um, about the, the overall uh, qualities of their neighbors, if that's the, the concern I have. So I think in a, in a well-managed state and in, in a respectful situation where people will, will think about who's really uh, working and who's trying to work, what, you know, that, that, that you can't make judgments about one group of people in any kind of simple way. Uh, and that um, people that are designing these places ought to be able to find ways of 
facilitating a mix that can benefit everyone and not just some parts of that mix. But these are good questions. Uh, thanks. I was wondering, have you heard that um, some of the uh, public housing residents were relocated to the suburban areas. I heard that this week again. I heard that a large part of the families were relocated to the southern suburbs and then also like to the western suburbs like Bellwood. Yeah, I you know I haven't studied the full pattern in Chicago in ways. I've seen some maps that show some movement into the southern suburbs, um, but I uh, I haven't seen you know enough to give any kind of statistics on that. Um, but but there have been uh, uh, people that have tried to map this, um, and and I suspect that there'd be a way of getting getting a hold of that, or at least trying to get a hold of that information. Um, and it would be very interesting to see, you know, what what the experience has been uh, for people in those relocations, uh, as well as the experience of the people in those neighborhoods that have received uh, residents. Um, in uh, because I, I know it has been controversial. Yeah, yeah, because I talked to uh, a young lady from Melbourne, and she says yes, a lot of residents have. Yeah, but there are also lots of people that have overestimated the scale of those moves um, and and cast negative assumptions on CHA residents who are not responsible for uh, for some of the demographic change that has been seen in in some some communities. So it's, a, it's one of these things that really needs careful data and a close look, I think. But I, I, and I hope you or someone you know will, will be doing that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. I wanted to speak and honor the memory of my uh, deceased aunt, who is a legend of CHA tenant organizing uh, out of the uh, Ida B. Wells homes uh, in Chicago. So I just wanted to honor the memory of uh, Helen Penner, my aunt. Um, I want to ask if, do you think that it's possible that the displacement of these large uh, uh, populations of poor people could be akin to maybe even genocide? What happens to people when they are displaced in this manner, uh, their life expectancy, the quality of life in terms of where they go? I'm just curious as to what your thoughts would be on that. And then also I'd like, in that light, I, I just saw uh, Spike Lee's uh, movie uh, documentaries, both of them, uh, when the levee's broke and also uh, when, the, when the creek rises, if God willing, and the creek don't rise. And, and, and so I'm wondering um, if you have any opinions on um, New Orleans mm. and how they're going to handle their, their uh, public health yeah. situation in light of Katrina. So the yeah, these are, these are great questions. Um, uh, genocide is a pretty strong word. I, I, I like the, the word that was used 50 years ago in a famous essay uh, by Mark Freed called uh, Grieving for a Lost Home. And it's a, it was an analysis based on a lot of interviews about the sense of loss that people felt uh, and, and how akin to the experience of grief uh, that was. And he was writing about the early urban renewal era, era but, but I think it's, an, it's a sentiment that has held up very strongly over over the decades, and um, and that there are certainly a lot of evidence, and other psychologists and psychiatrists like Mindy Fullalove in, in the book Root, Root Shock have tried to uh, make the make the case for for pretty deep psychological damage that happens to people from displacement. Whether it rises to genocide, I think is it's probably uh, a little further than I would want to go. But but I but I certainly don't underestimate. Uh, the lasting damage that has happened. And, and nowhere has that been more dramatic than in New Orleans. Um, I've tried to follow some of that story and in the, the, the next book, which I'm going to look at, at five other cities, including Boston and San Francisco and Tucson, like I mentioned, but also New Orleans and, and Washington, D.C., um, I'm trying to understand the context of, of how public housing has been tr transformed um, both after Katrina and even in the run-up to Katrina because it's not all that much of a, a break. I mean, there, there was a lot of very um, difficult politics in public housing before the storm hit, and uh, uh, it deserves far more time than I have just now, but um, hopefully I'll, I'll have a chance to come back sometime and, and talk about New Orleans in the context of, of some of these other, other places. 
Um, well, thank you all for braving the cold night and joining us here. Thank you.